money is there. The money is the benefits. Money is good. Money is good. Money right? is good. Let's just be honest. Money is good. I don't know nobody who doesn't like money. Yeah. <laughs> Myself and you included. Don't get into nursing because of the money aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Get into nursing because you truly are passionate about caring for people. Because that would be what would leave you with a lasting career. If you get into nursing just for the money aspect of it, it will, you, you'll find yourself just burnt out and just frustrating and not getting along with people at work and not really liking what you do. And not liking what you do will affect your home life, it will affect your work life, it will affect your, every aspect of your life. So do it because it's really truly what you actually want to do. is an opportunity for us to also reconnect even though i know we're here to do a podcast we're talking about being a nurse but i think it's great that we're connecting it's been yeah. like a moment i think has been so tell me how you're staying sane in the middle of covid19 especially given that you're a nurse like how are you taking care of yourself deep breathing exercises personally for myself and a lot of facial um, personal home remedy facial care that's um, your skin is popping like you're just glowy like the skin like the brown sugar like everything you're giving me right now it's just Tell us a little bit more about you. So we know that you're a nurse. So tell us a little bit more about who you are and how you got into nursing. Why, why you even went into that career path? So my name is Lucetta and Mara, for those that care. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we care. <laughs> um, so I'm a registered nurse. I work at an inner hospital here in Edmonton, the Royal Alexandra Hospital. Okay. And I have been there for working with AHS, Alberta Health Services, for about going to be 12 years now. Wow, girl. 12 years, eh? Yes, going to be. Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And so I, I got into nursing initially. Um, so I started working at a group home. Okay. And while I was at the group home, I realized that um, I like the, the care that I was providing for the patients there or the clients there in the community. Mm -hmm. And so my, it was actually my mom, my mother, who saw that passion in me 
and encouraged me to get into nursing. And so I listened to her. At first, I thought it was insane because I didn't think that I was that um, compassionate. Oh, okay. Then, you know, our mothers, they always see things in us that we don't necessarily see. Absolutely true. Yeah. So she saw it and encouraged it. And yeah, so I went on and um, went to school for to become an LPN first. Okay. So an LPN basically is a licensed practical nurse, which um, you go to school for two years um, here in Edmonton or in Canada, mostly two years. Um, that would it would dif- it would differ from province to province, but in Edmonton here it's two years, and I worked as a practical um, nurse for about ten years, 10, 11 years, wow. yeah, and then while I was you know I worked in internal medicine, general internal medicine. This is a, a word that basically you see everything across um, the nursing spectrum. So I then realized that I wanted to challenge myself to go even further. Um, given that I had already, um, I already had all my high schooling done mm-hmm. here. Yeah, so I figured, why not just challenge myself? Why um, not push myself, right? And then I decided to go back to school after 10 plus years of working in the field. And I did. And yeah, now I'm a registered nurse. Wow, 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 wow. Like, so I'm just thinking, like, all the money working 10 years. Like, did you have to give up a full time job to go back to school for your RN? Or, like, how did that look like? It was such a sacrifice. It was such a sacrifice. It wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy decision because I had a permanent full time, and those don't come easily. Yes. Um, especially with AHS um so I had to give that up and just take a leap of faith to finish my RN I lost all the income that I wow making and yeah I it's like I said it's a huge sacrifice I don't know if you know yes it is but I had to move actually from Edmonton to Saskatchewan. Oh, that's where you went to school. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, I had to leave Edmonton to Saskatchewan to go back to school just to become an RN for two years. So More. is there a reason why you didn't do it in Edmonton? So I could have done it in Edmonton, but it would have been um, online. And personally, I am not an online person. I tried. I did few courses online through Athabasca University. And I just realized that it wasn't for me, knowing myself. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of family in Edmonton. And so as a result, I am busy with family um, engagements. Of course. So, I needed to just release myself to be focused only on um, on school. And so that's what I did. Um, while I was here and taking classes throughout Tabasca and working full time, mm-hmm. I was just procrastinating. I wasn't really getting anything done. I was procrastinating and just not doing any of my work. So that was actually the, the main reason why I moved to Saskatchewan. Yeah, it's it's a huge leap of faith and definitely challenging to give up all that cash that you've been earning for like 10 years plus and then you're like I want to go back to school and get something higher than what I'm doing. And and right now that you're working as an RN, do you feel like it was worth that sacrifice so far? So far, I feel it is. It okay. is. Um, there's definitely more responsibility. I can feel it. Um, however, the payback is definitely worth it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So start to tell us a bit about some of the challenges that you might've experienced as you 
were studying either your LPN or your RN, just share with us what your education was like as you pursued a nursing career path. So some of the challenges that I encountered basically were um, just as an LPN. Mm -hmm. um, back then when I did my LPN diploma, it was the times that nurses were very short. So it, was, it wasn't as, as difficult to get into the program as it is now. Um, I actually, well, maybe let, let, let me not say not as difficult. It was difficult, but yes, not as, not as difficult as now. I was actually shortlisted um, for a while, say for about six months to a year. Mm -hmm. before I was called to say I was in. Actually, I think someone had to drop that year for me to enter into the program. Okay, and I see. Call, I quit my work. I think that same day, if I could remember. Wow. I quit that same day just to go back to school. Just to I'd go back to, yeah, the second time. Yeah. Yeah, I'd been waiting for it for, for so long, so. So I that means you were on the wait list to become an RN long before you actually got accepted no this is the lpn this is the okay the lpn okay. yeah so um lpn i was i was in a waiting list and then i got a call that someone had um dropped, dropped out okay i got into that spot so yeah and then the program itself the lpn program itself is very good the year i did it was actually the year that they stopped the RN diploma program. So I did the first LPN um, diploma program. Okay. I don't know if you guys kind of understand. So in Edmonton or in Canada, before, um, in the past, uh, RNs used to only go to school for, well, some RNs used to only go to school for two years and they would become an RN, but with um, a diploma RN. So in 2007, okay. that program was stopped. And I think 2007, 2008, that program was stopped. And that program then became the LPM program. The LPM diploma program. Okay. Program. Yeah. That was the program I did as an LPN. Okay. And yeah, it was going, going to school when you are younger as opposed to when I went back to school when I am older mm -hmm. RN is quite different. Yes. Quite different. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you have different responsibilities. That's how I would see it. Like, you know, you just life is different when you're a little bit, you know, older, you have more, you know, responsibilities. And maybe when you're younger, not as much, right? So Totally, totally get that. So now I've heard that the nursing, like, you know, becoming a nurse is really difficult, writing the exam. I know people who had to write it more than three times before they finally made it. Can you share what your experience was like writing the board exam for either the LPN and or the RN? Um, writing the, if I, when I, let me go back to the LPN. Writing the okay. LPN board exam, it was basically I finished school. I reviewed. I didn't. Re I didn't review my notes at all. I review. Uh, I bought a, a review book, which is what I reviewed off of um, for my LPN. And I think I reviewed for like three weeks, and I was ready to write it. And I wrote it the first time I passed. Wow. For the LPN. And the RN, I did the same thing because I figured if it, if it worked for the LPN, it would mm -hmm. work for the RN um, NCLEX exam. So I finished school. I, it was actually very, very difficult with the RN, pre preparing for the RN because it was during a pandemic. I couldn't go to a library. Yes. 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 And what I'm about not, the pandemic piece? Yeah, that will make it way more challenging. Way, way, way more. I'm not really a home study person. 
I would definitely not focus. I yeah, that's focus. me too. I need to be like in a structured environment. I need to be in a classroom, in the library, a lab, whatever, but not at home because <laughs> the right? fridge is calling, the TV is calling, social media is calling, <laughs> the kids are calling, you know, many things are calling. <laughs> Tell me about it. So that I thought about for the longest while. And I figured, you know what? When changing times, I just have to adapt. Yeah, that's true. So, and I did. I just kind of rearranged my environment to make sure that it's conducive for me in a way that I can study and still be focused. Um, so I created a, a study um, guide for myself. Now studying for the RN exam. Okay. Created a study guide and I followed this guide actually to the T, like to the dot. Wow. Just to make sure that, yeah. So I would basically, I bought a, a study guide, I bought a study um, resource online. Okay. Um, it's called U World. I bought it online. It was very expensive, but so worth it, worth it. And so I would answer, I would practice about 75 to 100 questions per day. Wow, girl. Right? So I did that for, I would do the, the 75 to 100 questions in the morning, like first thing when I wake up, say after I drop my daughter to school, I come home, make my coffee, drink it, and then just to perk up and answer the 75 question, like in a real testing situation, I would really test myself, like as if I was taking a real exam. Yeah, so you time yourself and everything. Everything, everything. So I would follow that. And then after I've answered the 75 question base, I'll give myself about three hours to do that because you want to make sure that you are, I wanted to make sure that I'm, I'm actually processing the question, not just skimming through the questions and not critically thinking about each Absolutely. and every one of my choices. Yes. Right? So I did that every day. And then in the evening, after I've answered all those questions, in the evening, I would then review the answers and the okay. rationale, right? So how many days did you do that? So you were doing 75 to 100 questions per day. Do you have an idea like how many days you did that review and practice before you wrote the exam? I would say a month, a solid month. Wow. Every day? Every, well, maybe with the exception of Sundays. This Sunday. is like, girl, this is like a new level of respect right here for all you nurses out there. Wow. It's intense. It's intense. Wow. NCLEX is intense. So not, not preparing myself for it. I, if I would have gone into NCLEX and not feel prepared, I would have... I don't know. I would have, I would have just felt very disappointed to have to like do it a, a second time because every okay. time you to write an exam the second time, then the anxiety is high. Yeah. Right? And we're going to talk about that because I, I know you didn't have to write your exam more than once as you've shared, but um, you know, I want us to also talk about how to help people who find themselves in that situation, right? You know that nursing is your calling. Like you said, your mom even you know, found that out. She knew somehow that this is where you belonged. And maybe that person knows that this is where they belong. But unfortunately, they're writing this exam and they're just not passing. So what I really like that you've done here is that you've provided us with some study strategy that worked for you, right? So you said basically having a disciplined, structured, well laid out study plan, and then following it to the T, like you said, and then buying a study resource to help you with answering questions and, and reviewing questions and setting your own structure to go at your own pace. So you've given some really good tips that I think will be helpful in any academic you know, profession, regardless of what I was nursing, right? But I also want you to talk about like that piece about the board exam. So if you don't, you know, if for whatever reason, 
one doesn't pass the first time and maybe possibly not the second time and you find yourself going to write it a third time and the fourth time, like what, what, I, what tips can you give? What advice can you give? I would personally say if you find yourself in that situation is to do a reflection. Okay. Whether it's, um, whether you're lacking aspects of the theory, parts of um, the exam, because what a resource or what a practice quiz or practice exam will give you really is it, it, it's different. Different practice exams will give you different strat, um, different things, right? Yes. The so world, I find for myself, it didn't really give me. It didn't really give me as much of a theory. I feel like you should have had the basics of that theory in school. Okay. But once you've mastered that theory in school, that knowledge is in you, right? So now what you all helped me with was just critically thinking through the answers that I was selecting and why I was selecting them and why one, even though all four mm -hmm. may be correct, okay. why one is more important than the other one, right? I see, yes. Yes. Yeah just why one is important than the other one because NCLEX itself looks for they have a pattern of the way they mark NCLEX is is completely different from the way exams in school are marked right completely different NCLEX is marked by a computer right it's a computer automated exam which the computer kind of senses if you are going to be a safe nurse entirely oh uh, wow Yes. Let's talk about that a little bit then for our audience to understand that. So it's not, so is this, does this then mean that it's not marking it based on necessarily right and wrong answers, but just based on like general, just the general way that you answer the question, do you fall in a safe category or do you fall in a risky category? nurse type category like I'm trying to process this and to understand it a little bit better I feel like it does market now it does take into account into account your the knowledge because you definitely need that knowledge to be able to critically answer the question mm -hmm. to be safe as absolutely a nurse, right to be safe as a nurse so in order to be safe as a nurse you have to put your critical thinking and your inquiry skills to answer those questions so the, I feel like the exam marks you based on safety, but that's not to say that you don't apply knowledge, right? You don't apply theory, you still right. have to apply theory, right? So that's why having that um, solid foundation in your theory will definitely help you to process the answers that you select, which your computer is going to then sense now you can confuse the computer right you can confuse the computer wherein if you are answering one question right and then one question wrong in the NCLEX you will definitely confuse the computer because it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be able to determine if you are if you're going to be safe right? exactly yes and in this instance the computer then would take you to the rest of the questions that is banked which is I think in, in my situation was like a hundred and I think it's a hundred and yeah, you're allowed to, to write 145 questions, I think. So the compu computer is confused, not where to, to put you mm -hmm. to the end of the exam. Right. Okay. I know there are myths out there about NCLEX being, if you go to NCLEX and you write up until 75 questions and the, uh, computer shuts down, okay. that means you pass automatically. That's false. Thank you for addressing that. So that's false if you, if the computer shuts down after 75 questions. And that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that you've passed automatically. Okay. Thank you. So, and it doesn't mean that if the, if the computer takes you all the way to 145 questions, that you failed. That's false as well. Okay. 
right? So therefore, don't panic. Don't panic because I think a lot of people go into NCLEX with the idea that I have to hit 75 question. Right at 75 question, the computer needs to stop, right? It doesn't work like that. So a lot of people, if the computer doesn't stop the exam at 75 questions, then they start to panic. Then they then start to, and then they won't even concentrate. I can see that happening to focus and finish the rest of the exam successfully because now you're like, oh, I must have failed. I'm at question 100. <laughs> I didn't make it, right? Yeah. So you confuse the computer because now you're panicking and you're second guessing yourself every time, every answer, every question that come now, you're second guessing yourself because you already assume that you've already failed, right? So if you continue in that, in that path, you're going to continue to get every other question wrong because now you're panicking. You're not thinking. Yes. Thank yeah. you for bringing that up. Thank you so much. So I also want to ask any advice for guys going into nursing. So we know nursing is a women's profession. Women tend to typically go into nursing and becoming a nurse. And what about for guys? I want to talk about men who want to pursue nursing and who may not necessarily get the support that they would have gotten if they were female from your family or, you know, the society, everybody else. So let's talk to our African men, our black men as well, who, you know, want to go into nursing, but they just feel like, yeah, nursing is, is not for men. It's not for macho men, it's for sissy men or, or whatever, right? So let's talk to them why it's great for them to come into the nursing profession. It's great for them to pursue that passion and that we welcome them with open arms to be there. So any advice for men thinking about or wanting to pursue nursing? Yeah, so again, yeah, that's just a very wrong ideology of like people saying that nursing is not for men. Um, nursing, it's so like, there are different paths that you can take in nursing. You don't necessarily have to be at the bedside, right? Okay. There are different paths. So I can totally understand why some men will think that, um, that it's not for them, but it's wrong. I, during the, 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 the whole course of the training of nursing, yes, you have to step out of your comfort zone as a man. And a lot of men are actually, a lot of men during the, the training of, an, uh, to become a nurse are, a watch, I should say, carefully, just because I think especially African men, right? Because we, 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 we believe that. Maybe let me give you an example. I was in a class in my LPN nursing, in my LPN um, schooling. I was in a class with a Muslim, black African Muslim guy, okay. right? But he was smart. He was very intelligent. However, he would say such things like, oh, I can't change a woman. I can't change like a brief. Yeah, because in I think that's in your religion, right? Like in your religion, you right. would you would take care of men if you're a man, and then if you're a woman, you take care of a woman. Right. But in a situation where you're going through nursing school, right. That right. Is, you can't bring that up to say, tell the instructor that I can't change a patient that's been assigned to you. You can't do that. Right? Yes. Now you can even when, when you're hired at a job at the hospital, you can't even say that, right? Yes. So, but especially so when you're in school, you cannot refuse to care for a person just because they're female, because it's like, it's contrary or to- Or your religious faith, you know, or whatever, so you yeah. You should have known that. You should have done your research. Yeah, before you, yeah, absolutely. Before you ventured into that career path, yeah. Right, so- I wouldn't say, I wouldn't want to discourage men to not get into it because I feel like once you've gone past that, um, that, that um, instructor phase where you are watched by an instructor and therefore your, um, your skills and all that, your assignments, you can't really select your assignments. I feel like you'll be fine once you, you've gone past the schooling, right? Okay. Into the workforce you then are able to dictate 
or a, a little bit able to dictate a little bit where you want to work as a nurse because there's a lot of places that you can work as a nurse not necessarily at the bedside yes so you can i've seen now now especially now a lot of men in a nursing field at the hospital that work at the bedside they now have been moving them or promoting them to like managerial positions right so i feel like if you know your job and you've put in the sacrifice and you're not um you put in the sacrifice there are different paths that you can take you can do okay. home care you can do you can become a management different types of management you can get into you can be yeah, you can be charge nurse where you're not really at the bedside as much, right? So like the triage people that you see like at emergency, like other the triage nurses that when you come into like a clinic or an emergency hospital, you're the people that receive the patients first. The patients, right. Yeah, in an emergency department. So you, you have that and... You can work at a clinic, at a doctor's office, where you're not directly providing like personal care, right? So there are different, different areas of nursing that men can get into if they're not comfortable with the personal care aspect of it. But I would say going through school, that's something that you cannot avoid. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And I hope that my male listeners are listening here. So Lucetta has said that there are other areas in nursing that you can venture into. So if personal care is an issue for you as a man and you want to go into nursing, she's mentioned charge nurse, management, working in the doctor's office, working in triage, you know, and that just do your research and know where you think you want to do after you've gone through that schooling part, because that schooling part you cannot get to pick and choose, unfortunately. So you have to go through everything, including personal care like everybody else. So I think that sometimes we also um, put this stereotype on men as well. So it's quite possible that, you know, some men don't have any problem with doing personal care, you know, in the hospital, as that is part of your job, that's part of your role. They go in there, they want to do it. Is it possible that they get there and maybe it's a female and then the female is like, hey, I want a female nurse. I don't want you. Can I have somebody else? So I want to also talk about that side too, because I feel like that side does exist. I've heard about, for example, certain people going to a doctor's office and then they get there, they don't see their own ethnic group in the hospital. So they're like, I want my own people. I want this other person, right? you know? And then you're like, well, this is what you get, right? So take it or leave it kind of thing. So I want to talk about that as well in this perspective. So what if it's the patient now who is perpetuating this stereotype because you go to the hospital or to the clinic or wherever, you expect to see a female nurse because again, it's a, it's a job that are, is traditionally performed by women. But you meet a man, he's obviously very qualified, nice enough to do his job. But then the patient says, no, I don't want a male nurse. I want a female nurse. How can we educate our listeners about that bias as well? So that's something definitely that, that happens at the hospital. Okay. Uh, it does happen. And I have to say that patients have the right to refuse. Okay. They have that right. That's their, that's their right to refuse. They have the right to refuse care. They have the right to, um, now they don't have the right to, to select the nurse that they want to, to work with them personally on, say on the issue of like a race type thing. They don't have that right, right? Okay. They don't have, they, if it, in terms of religion, when a patient refused to be taken care of, say, by a male, the female, we tend to encourage them to perhaps um, have a family member. This is like in the days where family members would come to the hospital. Well, right, before COVID, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Leave their personal care, like the washing and bathing, to like 
the family members to do that when they come, if that's their personal preference. Okay. So we have that option. Or at the hospital, if that option isn't available, Mm -hmm. we work in in teams at the hospital where in one team you have the RN, the LPN, and a healthcare aide in one team. So there has to be a female in that group of people in that one team that's caring for the patients that you're caring for. So then you can then assign another person, a female person that's preferable preferable by the patients to care to do the personal care. Okay. So you have options, basically. So there are options exactly to work around that. Okay. So no need to be discouraged if you're a guy looking into pursuing nursing. There are people out there like Miss Lucetta who's more than happy to, you know, just show you how you can go about doing this by educating yourself, just do some research, read, like she said, or ask questions, basically, wherever you are, right? Yeah, ask questions. So tell us now what a day in the life of a nurse looks like. So I want to know what a day in either general internal medicine that you talked about earlier or in your current role, or maybe even both. So a day in the life of a nurse. Um, so basically you leave home, you get to the hospital, okay. mask up, you have to wear a mask before you enter into the hospital mm-hmm. and wear a um, facial goggle before you enter. And then you get there, you um, there's a thing on the AHS website that we have to um, complete before we get to work. It's called Fit for Work. Okay. So each, nurse, or each person that goes to the hospital has to be fit for work, especially um, in terms of COVID, right? Yes. So then another nurse has to look at that um, fit for work questionnaire that you would have answered and sign you off to say that, okay, you did that. You, you can be signed off. So you do that. You sign in your name, just like you were clocking. Okay. Sign in on a piece of paper. And then you pick up your, you look at the team that you are in and then you pick up your report sheets and you go into like a general uh, uh, conference room where um, updates are provided. And basically the manager of the units will then come and speak on different topics, like topics such as um, admission rates or such as um, infection um, spread within the unit, such as just any any complaints by family members or complaint or concerns mm-hmm. that we have. So he'll discuss that in like that general meeting in the morning, and then we will then all disperse into our various teams, where we would then take reports on our specific patient assignments, and. Mm-hmm. Then, yeah, discuss amongst ourselves as a team after we've received reports from the night shift. Basically, if it's a morning shift you're working, you get a report from the night shift on your patients, how they did last night, overnight, and what happened, what changed, or just basically any updates. And then we will then kind of huddle within our little teams and then just talk about what, how the day is going to go and how the day looks like. If my team member is busy or has a busier assignment, we might just kind of do some adjustments to um, usually the RN would then kind of like do, like kind of readjust the assignments for that team and just make sure that it, like the assignment is fair. And then the, that the RN is taking the most sick patients, like the most acute patients and not leaving the most acute patients for the, for the LPN. And yeah, I think just that. And then we all kind of go about our own personal assessment to our patients and um, yeah, and then just huddle as the day go by. Okay. So when you're moving from patient to patient, what is that like? So we see so many things on TV. I'm just, uh, my head is, you know, spinning with a number of questions. So do you always have to change your face shield, your mask your gloves like every single thing when you go from patient to patient even though you might be visiting let's say 15 patients within a few minutes of each other mm. yes. so what what does that 
what does that look like? So yes, we do have to change our mask, like PPE. Mm -hmm. our PPE in between patients. So uh, that means like our goggles, our masks, our gloves, our gowns. Gowns, okay. Washing of hands before you get a glove, washing of hands after you take gloves. Just like how many times a day do you guys wash hands? Have you ever counted? <laughs> Just curious. It's it's hard to count because you get so used to it that oh my gosh, you're not downing or you're not dock, you're not donning like putting on gloves. Docking or you, donning, yeah. You you still even if you're just walking along the hallway because you have people watching you too, right? We have extra eyes who are monitoring, uh. donning, doff. Oh, so yeah. like so when you want to. Okay, I want to make sure I understand this. So every single time you have to change your PPE between patients, there's someone actually making sure you're doing it right. Yeah. So do you have to do it like in a station and then there's somebody stationed in that particular spot? Or like, oh, is it just a random person who is like uh, undercover police <laughs> watching? Um, the person is known to everyone in the, on the unit. Okay. Okay. Colleagues, right? So the person is known. The person basically just stands in the center of like the unit, if it's like a L-shaped unit, they stand there and they can see from end to end, right? So basically, okay. as soon as they spot someone going into a patient's room, then they know to keep their eye on that patient. And then if they spot another person there, they know to watch that person, how they're donning, how they're doffing and how they're donning, right? And they are then, they would then correct the person if you've done it wrong. Okay. So it's not like you're going to lose your job if you do it wrong more than once or something. It's just the person is just there to educate and provide support and be like, okay, you missed this step. Can you redo it? Yeah. Okay. You missed a step. Just don't do it next time. Correct. Okay. Yeah. What if you do it next time? Then what? Well, then you probably be, you probably have a talk with the manager. Oh, <laughs> not cool. So you guys are going, you know, you guys are doing so much and I want to use this uh, moment to just say thank you so much, Lucetta, for your service as a registered nurse on behalf of, you know, I want to stand in the gap on behalf of Edmontonians to say thank you for what you do and so many other nurses and frontline workers out there because we're in this pandemic is over a year now and the sacrifice that you guys have to make. Like I'm just thinking about the washing hands alone and all that thing that you, all the things you have to wear. It's a lot on your face. Might even be feeling like you're suffocating sometimes, like you're heating up, it's too warm. You know, you know all, that, all that extra stuff that we didn't used to do pre-COVID that you guys have to do now every single day. You know, some of us are complaining about wearing masks to go outside, but you guys don't have that choice. This is what you do. If you work eight hour shift, 12 hour shifts, this is your life, mm -hmm. you know? So imagine um, the sacrifices that you're making and the reason why the general public needs to honor that sacrifice by making sure that we're taking the necessary precautions and doing the needful. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. thank you. Definitely. So do you take care of COVID patients? I'm just... Curious what that, what that is like caring for persons who have COVID. So I did in the past, okay. um, but how they, the unit that I'm assigned um, to right now, how um, AHS, specifically the, the, the hospital I'm at, have um, worked things out is that we have designated COVID units. Right, so we have designated COVID units that are only for COVID positive patients. Right, so my unit is not a COVID designated unit, but I did work with COVID patients in the past. And so when patients come from eMERGE, they are tested in eMERGE and are cleared in eMERGE right, to come up to the units. So then they're dispersed onto the various units. They come onto my units. If they are, they don't, they're not positive anymore, but if they are positive, then they go to a different units. However, 
they can still come to my unit if they test negative for COVID, but they still have symptoms, right? So when they come to my unit, they still have symptoms, we still isolate them. Of course, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Because with this whole situation, you never just know, right? Yeah, you like, never know because the virus keeps changing, right? So yeah. they may have tests negative and emerge, and then maybe five days later, they're showing massive symptoms and then they become positive. Mm -hmm. that happens. Okay. Yeah. So we do still keep very close eye on them and isolate them and we take proper proper precaution to make sure that we're mitigating that risk. Yeah. And just curious, have you, were any of your patients like African people, black people? With COVID? Yeah, with COVID. Oh, yes. Oh, and, wow. and that's, um, that's it's, it's such an irony because a lot of African people Initially, I, I, I should say. Initially, yes. Yeah, let's preface that. Yes. COVID affects Black people, right? I think we know that now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and excuse that we're laughing about it, but, we'll, you know, we know that now that, that it does. Like, we're not made of stone. Our new system is not as hard as rock. Things do permeate. Yeah. And COVID is one of those things that can permeate. And research shows that COVID, in fact, is, um, it, it affects people of color more than it does white people, right? I saw and the research. Yeah. The reason for that is that we live, like, people of color um, live in, like, homes where our mothers are in, our grandpas are in, mm -hmm. children, grandchildren multi-generational homes where um, Canadians, or white people, they only have nuclear families living in the same home. Yeah, most times, yes. So in situations where we have multi-generational people living in home and you would also find healthcare workers in that home, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's basically like, um, it's, it's just a disaster for COVID, it's just a perfect storm a, yes. for COVID to spread. Perfect storm, perfect environment. Perfect environment. Yeah. You're sharing beds, you're sharing like a tight space, you're sharing everything. It's a perfect place for COVID to just ravage through. So, so tell me a little bit about what that, because I know you said you, you're not doing it right now, but in the past you took care of COVID-19 patients. Are you able to just share, even if it's just a little bit, I don't want to break any confidentiality issues, but just a little bit of what that felt like or what that experience was like caring for people who tested positive. People fall very, very sick. Very sick, yes. Very, very sick. Um, it, was, it was very personal in that I felt like I was stuck in between two places where... I was trying to educate my people yes. who are reluctant and not, believe. Mm -hmm. not believing into the, in the COVID situation. And I'm going to work every single day dealing with people that are dying from COVID who don't even have the opportunity to ha even have their family members come at the bedside to, at watch, the them bedside to watch them die. I know and say their final words and their mm -hmm. goodbyes. So it was very, very difficult. That situation looked like a patient who is not able to breathe, who is, even though they have all the supports of oxygen, they're still not able to communicate. Their words are very limited. They will say one word and they go out of breath and they're very wow. like, weak. They're not able to eat. And we're supporting them in every way possible, whether it's through nutrition through their veins or every way possible, just so kids. So they can't speak like. It's exhausting to talk? Very exhausting. Very, very, very wow, exhausting. Wow. To talk. Because with every speech, you're using energy, right? With every speech, you're using all that energy that you have, that reserve that you could utilize to just hold on, right? So if you're using that, using that then it just becomes that much more difficult, 
right? And that's the reason why a lot of patients are then intubated into ICU because if it's already difficult for them to breathe and they're using that extra reserve of energy that they have to talk and do other things, then they might as well just intubate them and just like have them just relax, right? Yeah. So COVID is real. COVID is very real. It's very difficult for healthcare workers um, to see that aspect and of, of people being sick at the hospital and caring for them and <laughs> continuously masking at the hospital. Continuous yeah, continuous masking. For 12 hours, 16 hours a day. And just that effect that it will have on healthcare workers, the, 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 the long-term effects, we don't even know what that long-term effect is. Yeah, the long-term mental health effect, physical effect as well. You know, right. because I've been seeing people with like scarring from wearing this mask and everything else all day long, many days a week. Hence why I have to, I have really increased my facial regimen during this pandemic because like person, I, you see people break out. Like, I don't know if you can see close, but like you break out. You feel like you're just personally, I feel like I'm like, you get headache just even from wearing continuously masking you yes. get sick because you're breathing in your own your own your own co2 right which is yeah. a waste product you're supposed to breathe that out your That's body true. needs that waste to be breathed out, to, to to come out to Not come to, out yeah right so it's very difficult when people don't listen to public health guidelines it's just like okay i know you want to live your life but at the same time, until this is gone, you can't really live a life that you want to. No, you can't because this involves the rest of us too, not just you. Yeah. Like if you don't want to care about your life, you must care about other people's lives. Like it's so important. Thank you for sharing what that experience is like caring for COVID-19 patients. And the reason I ask that is just for anyone out there who's still kept skeptical, I believe that, you know, a number of us, you know, our own community included have uh, seen things differently now than they used to initially right but if perhaps there are still people out there who are still clueless or who want to kind of remain in la la land i hope that this experience you've told us about your personal caring for a person with covid19 just hopefully wakes them up and they can see that this needs to be taken seriously so i want i know you told me that you have gotten your vaccine I also want you to just take this opportunity to let us know what that felt like when you got your vaccine. Did you have any side effects? Were you sick, ill? Um, anything at all that you want to share after you got your vaccine? So I was actually very, very excited to get my vaccine. Regardless oh. of what I was so excited. <laughs> You're like the only person I know who was excited. Okay, that's good. I was, because I believe in, I believe in science. See, yes. I'm a Christian. Let's go to the whole Christian thing. I'm yeah. a Christian, but I believe in science. Absolutely. God made wisdom. science. That's what I believe. God gives wisdom, right? God, yes. If God has given the wisdom to people to create science, hmm? to make our lives better. Absolutely. So, no, I was very, very excited. Regardless that they didn't have much research, mm -hmm. I always knew that not getting the vaccine is much worse absolutely than the the virus. the virus yes i had a doctor come on my show just recently and he said exactly what you said getting the virus without the vaccine you will be way worse off than if you had the vaccine and then got the virus yes so i personally i feel i felt like i was like whenever I would get the flu vaccine, this is a seasonal flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was even much sicker than the the, the COVID vaccine. With the oh. COVID vaccine, I only had just body just body ache, arm ache mm -hmm. for like that day that it happened, and that was it. Oh, nice. That was it. Usually, at times, not not all the time. At times, when I get the flu vaccine, the seasonal flu vaccine, I become very very sick. From it and yes, yes that can happen mm -hmm. it's a good thing because it's just stirring up an immune response in me when you get sick from a flu vaccine or a covid vaccine 
it only means that you're getting the protection that you are actually need. need. That's what it yeah. means. It doesn't mean that you are now sick because of the of this. Yes, you are sick of it, but it's it's in a good way, right? Because you now have protection. Yeah. So, you know, uh, our people are skeptical because of misinformation, misconception about the vaccine. I'm just wondering where do you think people can go for authentic information, to verify information? If they're worried about COVID, the vaccine or anything else, where are, what are some sources that you can mention that people can go to go find information here in Canada or outside Canada? So one reliable source that I would definitely recommend people to go um, on is the AHS website. So Alberta okay. Health Services website. Okay ahs.ca you would find a lot of information about the vaccine and stuff like the different vaccines like the moderna the pfizer the johnson and johnson and just going back to the to the astrazeneca vaccine right okay. yes I know a lot of people are not wanting to take it because people of are afraid of that one yeah because of just imagine, okay, just imagine not taking those people that, that got blood clots from that vaccine. Just imagine now if they hadn't taken the vaccine and they got the virus, the live, the actual coronavirus. Just imagine how sick, what else it would have been, yeah. That, right? So the blood clot is treatable, right? That you can, you can, you can solve that problem. You can mitigate that. You can, you can solve that problem. Not getting the vaccine is worse off. So any vaccine that you really can get, go and get it because it's still providing protection. It's providing protection for you and your family and those around you. And it will allow us to get out of this pandemic sooner. But yeah, yes, go to the, gov to the AHS website, go to the Government of Canada website. It seems like every major website now these days they have information about COVID. Like even if you go to the Heart and Stroke Foundation, yes. information about COVID. Even if you go to Corner, like the RN licensing body, they will have information about about um, COVID nineteen. Just any trusting, um, reliable website will have information about COVID. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. Absolutely. Even WHO has information about COVID-19 as well. So yeah, that's very true. So um, now I'm wondering about, you've said this a little bit, but I want you to just spell it out for us a little bit more. You've told us so much about a life in the day of a registered nurse and your journey to becoming a nurse, and especially now in the middle of a pandemic. What advice or what do you want to say to our people listening to this podcast today about general public safety? What should they be doing? How should they be protecting themselves and protecting others? And why should they be taking COVID-19 seriously? So COVID-19 should be taken seriously because it is, it's a deadly virus. Unlike, I know people would say, okay, we had the SARS before and mm -hmm. I didn't even, I, I'm sure I, I personally didn't even hear about SARS as much. And I was in no, this No, I didn't hear about it. Yeah, I didn't hear about I don't think I was in this country yet, but I didn't hear about it as much. As I think, much. It, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so you're right. It has a high infectivity rate. Yes, low mortality rate but high, high, high infectivity rate. So therefore, it's, it will spread like wildfire, right? It will spread like wildfire. It kills less, but now with the new strains, it's mm. the, the mortality rate is going up, right? Because right. now the virus has learned to like just mutate. It's like it just keeps changing its form. As soon as they try to, uh, with especially with with uh, migration and stuff like that, just movement from one place to the other, it just changes its form. So it's very hard to kind of control a, a virus like that, except if you actually follow the guidelines of the the public safety guidelines. Yes. And if you don't follow them, yeah. such as like washing, the masking when you go out in public, and not 
um, gathering in public. Not yeah. gathering for parties, just follow the public health guidelines. Not, not having secret parties. No. <laughs> yes. So people are like throwing like parties in the in the dungeon somewhere in your basement or like damn. Uh, people and if you are you know, I understand summer is coming. Oh yes. Socialize barbecue yes. season. Barbecue with your family at home, outside. Go to the park with your family, with the people that you actually It's just it's not the same. If you if you barbecue just with your immediate family, it's not the same, right? But when you have like huge gatherings with your neighbor and your friends from wherever else, that's when you feel like it's a party. That's Do you know I, what I mean? I know. But just imagine if you can get out of this in like a couple months, then you're able yeah. to do that. Then we can do that. There you go. Right? Yes. You're able to travel. Look forward to like what is ahead. Like the traveling part of it. Like that's what I'm looking forward to. If we can crush this, this virus, I can travel. Yeah. I'm yeah. I'm so wanting to travel. Like I haven't traveled in, you know, two years and I miss it. You know, mm -hmm. I miss it. I miss being able to just go visit people. Hey, how are you home? And the person's like, yeah, I'm home. And then you just, you know, pick up your car keys and off you go. Yeah. So I miss all of that. But like you said, if we want to return to some level of normalcy, yeah. we have to take the public health precautions. We have to follow the public health guidelines. And then we can arrest this virus, you know, put it where it belongs, and then we can move on with our lives somehow. But we can't do this. We can't travel. We can't have the barbecue season. We can't have all of that until we do what Lucetta has just told us. And you've heard from a nurse herself. So I think um, what better way to drive home the point but you sharing with us firsthand um, your own experience in hospitals and clinics. So we are very close to the end of our conversation today. Any advice just general advice to people who are listening today who either are skeptical about the vaccine or the or even the virus itself any general advice to them i would say take the vaccine right okay without the vaccine we would not really get to herd immunity right we need to be able to get to herd immunity to be able to crush this virus really and just because people are getting infected, it's not as, it doesn't provide as strong of an immunity through infection as it would if you were to get vaccinated. So get vaccinated. That's how we would get to the end goal of this entire pandemic, right? Vaccination is not new. No, people it's not. Vaccination yeah. that all of a sudden that is a mark of the beast or how yeah there's all kinds of stories <laughs> yeah it is so yeah. not the mark of the beast if if you think that you are being marked and to be traced and followed around by a government you're already being traced and followed around by a government yeah you, your social insurance number is doing that for you <laughs> so this is not it yeah this, no. is not it. this is simply a virus that's ravaging the world and we need to just crush it so taking the vaccine is the best that you can do for yourself, is the best that you can do for the world, is the best that you can do for your family and your loved ones to just kind of save their lives. And not doing that is basically doing the, the, the opposite of not, not saving your loved ones' lives because then they're dying. Wow. Right? You don't know if your family is next in line. So you want to do all that you can to save their lives. Wow. This is heavy information that you just said right there. That is huge. Basically, the vaccine is just not about you, but it's about the people that you love and the people around you. So save your lives. Thank you so much, Lissetta. Last thing I want to ask is any final key advice to people who want to become a nurse? Nursing right now in the middle of a pandemic is way more difficult, way more challenging as you've shared already. It's not like it used to be pre-COVID because there's all these extra layers, all these extra precautions that we need to do now. So anybody who's thinking about nursing, any advice to them? I would say if don't get into nursing because of the money aspect of it. Mm. Get into nursing because you truly are passionate about be what would leave you with a lasting career if you get into nursing just for the money aspect of it, it will, you will, you'll find yourself just burnt out and just frustrating and not getting along with people at work and not really liking what you do and not liking what you do will affect your home life it will affect your work life it will affect your every aspect
will do it because it's really truly what you actually want to do and that you love the interaction with people you love to help people and that yeah just don't do it for money the money is there the money is with the benefits money is good money is good money is good let's just be honest money is good i don't know nobody who doesn't like money (laughs) myself and you included but still we spend some research say we spend more than 60 percent of our life at work so imagine if you didn't like your profession that would be horrible like you just said so make sure you do it for the passion for the love of it and not just for the money thank you so ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for listening to today's episode with Bosera, a registered nurse here in edmonton alberta and uh, it's been a wonderful conversation chatting with you Lucera. thank you so much for coming thank you so much for giving me your precious time it's been wonderful thank you thank you so much for having me you're doing you're welcome. Welcome. oh thank you <laughs> thank you